Fellowship with, uh, with brothers and sisters who are here. Thank you for um, for Haley and her sister, whose name I've forgotten already. Cheyenne. Cheyenne, who's here <coughs> tonight, Lord. We're so grateful for that. And uh, Lord, we do ask you that you would uh, um, answer the questions that are on our hearts and help us to remember the things that we want to know of you and that we need to know of you to grow in your grace and knowledge of the truth. Please forgive us for every sin in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay. 
Are you ready to pass that offering plate around now? Yes. Okay, we'll do 423 while we're doing that. Okay. 423. Traveling back Friday, 
Oh, we'll be flying back in Friday also. Oh, she's feeling better. Called him this morning and talked to him. They went back to see the doctor in Pine Bluff while they were up there right after they got up there. And uh, he said when he realized what he had done, he was literally just shaking. Oh. He misprescribed the medicine. Um, by all accounts, it should have killed her. So God's being gracious. So, uh, so hopefully they'll get over on what the outcome of that will be. <coughs> Sister Patty, I delivered her car back Monday. She said she thought she was going to take herself to the hospital and figured they'd keep her three or four days. Oh, well, she's not here tonight, so I'm assuming maybe that's what happened. Ruth uh, Taylor called today while I was trying to get my van fixed and said they'd put Brother Gill back in the hospital in Sanford again. Don't do his part this time. So he's down in uh, room 365 in Sanford, so you pray for him. Your dad at home, Randy? Yes, yeah, my, my father. Uh, the aforementioned prayer request, uh, uh, it's a pretty serious cut, lost quite a bit of blood, and uh, he is struggling with an issue that he's really brought before me and the Lord that he wants uh, to to resolve and draw him closer to God. Okay. Any others? Yes. I have to start a new medication tomorrow. Not one that I'm thrilled about because we involve taking shots in my abdomen. He'd enjoy it too much. Yeah, I, I don't know how that Praise goes. Your Our family's on the mend. Yeah. Oh, good. See you. Yeah, Brother Chris here tonight. Still moving. Sir? Still moving. Still moving, yes. That's a good thing. Still remember Ryan and Erica, they're still trying to find a place to move. Deadline's tomorrow, so. Yes. Um, I've been keeping track of Uncle Joe's blood pressure morning and night, and I took the readings over to his cardiologist, and they said his blood pressure too high, so um, he's going to continue taking his blood pressure medicine, but they're going to start him on another one, go along with that one, to see how that works. So hopefully, he get his blood pressure under control. All right. Any others? Yes. I can also give shots. You, you can give shots. Praise you for it. I can if I have to. <laughs> <laughs> I have a praise you for it. Yesterday I gave um, Rick some money that had been given to me by Jonathan. And. Um, I asked him to call the license that we owe money on for my little hospital visit. And um, so I wanted to pay those. And we hadn't heard from him in the last month. Hadn't got any more bills. Yeah, we sent him some information yeah. the first time. So he called them yesterday and. Um, they saved my balance to receive it. Oh, wow. praise God. So God just keeps the phone. Well, that would not be the first time that's occurred either. Uh -huh. So I took, took her lunch. I said, What do you want to do with the money that's left over after I got these bills? <laughs> yeah. All of it. <laughs> yeah, they had told us to, to get a discount. We needed a little better from the hospital where they had given us a self pay discount. And then both of them said they got the letter, they decided to write the whole thing. One year So that's a little bit true. We just have one more year. That'll be it. 
Well, I have a crazy report. I have faith that all my bills are going to be paid. <coughs> okay. <laughs> I just have to start paying. People we'll have to start uh, lining up if you get that going. Yeah. <laughs> that easy. <laughs> right, any other requests? Praise reports. I wish you'd play, pray for me. Wow. What are we doing now? Mm -hmm. just, now, third graders are just not as smart as what I'm used to. Mm -hmm. They're really struggling in math. I took almost all morning today with the third graders in math. I'm just telling you. They give you the slow cut? No, it's just they just happen to be that way. And it's starting to frustrate me. Something I've been teaching in all 50 for 50. I've been teaching over and over. Just pray that it'll click. And it's nice. Like that? Yeah. That's what you get when you try to teach algebra to third grade. I mean, it's hard <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I've noticed that sometimes the, uh, the, the books tend to over-explain things. And that causes confusion. And so when they read from the book, <laughs> whereas if you just show them... Huh? They don't read. I read too. Oh yeah, yeah. I've explained it in Yeah. If you're gonna get it to pray, I guess pray for me. Pray Amen. For me. They will. Yes, George will. Please don't. Mm. Well, I'll do this, please. Heavenly <laughs> Father, we thank you again for the opportunity to be here for us and hear your word and sing your praise. We thank you again for all the things that you give to us and all the things that you made for us that are so beautiful to see. We ask that you hear our prayers and our requests and that you look after the people that aren't here tonight that would like to be here. It's that time of year when people are, are especially busy now. It's going to get busy when we get ready to say, Celebrate the day we pray. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen. Amen. We'll get Jit and Phyllis again. Her parents. <coughs> That's why they're not here tonight. Trying to get everybody settled in. Any of you got there? No. Amen. Mr. Willis said she was glad to be here and went on joining and looking forward to being with us. They're turning up our road now. Will they doing that when you were there? Well, they've done it since then. I saw it. I avoided it today. I went back out the other way. <laughs> Turned it up. Looks like they're widening it for you. We've made it. They got all the caves off of it now. Downtown. I appreciate your property value. Okay, any questions tonight? Uh, unless somebody else wants to go first, please. I, I have a question that seems almost ridiculous. Uh, and of course, I over explain everything, so I'll just go ahead and explain the fact that I over explain everything. Um, anyhow, <laughs> many are called but few are chosen. That's mentioned several times. It seems to me to almost always refer to the the Sanhedrin, the the the, uh, the Jews, the the Pharisees and Sadducees. And uh, um, however, there there was one particular reference where it, it, it seemed to refer to the disciples, and I just wonder if you had any insights on that. That that uh, you could share in light of comparison with eternal security for salvation. Okay, uh, somewhere I've got to get it. It's on the third computer system back. It's the main problem. I see. On the five and a quarter inch floppies on the <laughs> early Apple system. Right. So I can't, you know, just exactly transfer it over to, to Microsoft. But what I want to say is, this falls in the domain of what I did in my master's thesis. 
the title was The Sovereign Will of God and the Free Moral Agency of Man. Is there a conflict? Which is in what you're saying. And I'm, I'm saying it this way for this purpose. I took, I took the word chosen and I so every time it's mentioned in the Bible, which is 400 and something times, and then I categorized them. Chosen, the word chosen always has to do with service, never salvation. That's right. As a matter of fact, the parables uh, in which they occurred that I was reading in Matthew had to do with the talents and the workers. Exactly. Uh, right. So here's here's how it breaks down. God chose Israel. Uh -huh. That was a service covenant. God chose Jerusalem, the place where he wanted service done. He chose a house in that place. He chose Aaron and his sons to be the servants. Everywhere you go, it's the word that's used for choosing people in military. Yeah. Well, of course, all the guys that have served, they, they always laugh when I give this example. But I, you know, they just they just go to boot camp and walk down the line and say, "Now you're going to be the lieutenant, and you're going to be the major, and you're going to be the sergeant." Right? Is that how they do it? No. <laughs> Many are called into service, but few are chosen to be promoted and make rank and things like that. It's based upon service. And that's the only key I can give to you. Well, that's, that's a pretty good answer. Thank you. But it always, every, in every case, when you look into it, when you look into context, it, there's always a criteria. There's always conditions as far as the choice is concerned. And, and the illustration that, that I also use is this. When I was looking for a wife, there were many women in the world that were eligible. Ah. But out of all the eligible ones, I selected one. Uh-huh. Indeed. See, there's criteria, and that's the way God has laid it down. He calls everybody to salvation, but not everybody's going to be saved. And after salvation, he calls everybody to service. Not everybody's going to serve. I like that analogy. Except for the in reverence to God and fear. Everybody in the family is not the bride. Have you been to a wedding lately? Right. But in, again, in some people's Bible theology, everybody's everybody's bride. Well, that doesn't quite work. I think the master teacher knew what he was doing with some of these examples and illustrations that he gave. One of the seven laws of teaching is you teach from the known to the unknown. That's what parables are all about. You take a, a physical lesson that people know, and then you teach a a spiritual lesson that they don't know. That's why Jesus used the basics. I am the bread of life. Who doesn't understand what bread is about? Okay? Jesus is to us spiritually what bread is to us physically. He said, I am the water of life. Who doesn't understand that? You know, it's just as necessary to have him spiritually as it is to have physical water. He says, I'm the light of the world. Who doesn't understand that? And, and can apply it. That's how he taught. And that's how, how we're supposed to teach. But it, it is on on that subject of uh, choice and chosen. And people get fouled up on words like, you know, the, the foreknowledge and the... Uh -huh. Predestination. Predestination. And, mm -hmm. Well, pre I, and I, I see it. Things that seem to be opposite or not. Like, um, for instance, the, the, the whole... Choosing and following through and the predestination. Come all who will, enter all who will, and all who will have in the eyes of God because he sees the end from the beginning. Yes. But the there's also where they go wrong then is they try to make God cause it because God because God knew it ahead of time. Doesn't mean that he caused for not whom he foreknew he did predestinate. He yet, but it's because will, he, he foreknew. He's going to do, but he doesn't make right. you believe or not believe, and that's where the Calvinists go. Right, right, exactly. So, and Arminius was trying to refute him, and that's when he came up with the doctrine of falling from grace, because one of Calvin's points was the perseverance of the saints. If you're saved, you're going to persevere to the end, and then trying to refute that, and so. 
That's that's where the thesis is laid out. It says that here's the truth. Here's where Calvin went wrong when he said this. And then here's where Arminius went wrong on this hand trying to refute what Calvin said. The truth right here in the middle of the whole time. Praise so, God. So, so awesome. that, that's what we're working on. Okay. Amen. Does that answer your question? Very well, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Bible words, all right? The opposite of pride is humility. The opposite of humility is pride. As I heard someone say that humility is such a precious commodity, the second you think you have it, you've lost it. You've lost it, yeah. yeah. See, that's kind of where the line between humility and pride is. Now, if, if we use different words, if we say, I'm proud of what I did, in, in, the, in the matter of saying, I understand God helped me. I can do nothing without him. That's humility. But I'm, I'm pleased and I'm confident with what I've done. In that regard, pride's an okay thing in the Bible. But to say, I did this all on my own. I don't need God. He gives a good example in the book of Daniel with Nebuchadnezzar where, where that's not an order. See, he, he predicted he was going to send him out till seven seasons. I believe that. I don't know if that means years or, you know, almost two years, but he was going to send him out there to act like an animal. And uh, that had been prophesied, and in spite of that, it says that Nebuchadnezzar walked out one day, and he looked and he said, look at this great Babylon that I have built. When he knew God had set him up, see. So when he when his heart was lifted up with pride, then God humbled him. He taught him what humility was all about. And when it was over, he said, now, now I praise and extol God. So it's all where we draw the line. If, if we're saying we did it, that's pride. That's not a good thing. If we're saying we took what God gave us as far as abilities is concerned and we took advantage of the opportunity that we had to serve, then, then that's the appropriate thing where, where the honor and the praise and the glory goes to him. So that's the only way I know to explain it. Oh, does it does it make sense? Yeah, well, yeah, it makes sense. But I think that the thing that confuses me is that when you said when you give an example, you said I did it on my own or that. Yeah. I don't think that's the way it's used in the everyday world, particularly in in people that have done an outstanding job and they're the ones that are first to say. Yeah. Thank God for that, and I couldn't have done it without all these people. Right, I understand. That's the reason. I but I'm saying that's that's where the line is. You know, it's it's just kind of like if we're here, it's pride, and if we're here, it's humility. And that's another one of those things that's evasive. You know, that there's a lot of things where the line is really, really close as to when you're here and when you're there, and that's the. Like I heard the debate today, I guess you've heard it about the guy up north that, that killed the two people that broke in his house. You, you didn't hear about that? Thanksgiving Day, these two uh, teenagers broke in, a, a boy and a girl. 
it, the guy had been burglarized. This was going to be like the eighth time he was in the basement. He's 64 years old. He's ex-State Department security. And he got his gun. And when the guy started down the stairs to the basement, he shot him. He fell down the stairs and he shot him again. He waited. The other one started down, shot one, two, three with a, with a final one this time. And they're charging him with second degree murder. Now, I said that to say this. People always want to know, well, what can I do to protect myself and my property? Well, when I was a policeman in Arkansas, you could protect yourself, but you weren't allowed to protect your property. I'm, I'm going to explain. See, this is how I explain to people. say, well, how do I know? I said, well, let me give you an illustration. Here's your front door. If a guy comes in and kicks in your front door and leaves, that's vandalism. All he's done is destroyed your property. You have no right to use deadly force against that fellow. I said, but if he kicks the door in and steps inside, now he's in imminent danger to you and whoever's in the house. He's bought and paid for. Do you, people understand that. So, so that's where that line is. So that's what we're talking about. It's a fine line to, to get people to, to get them to understand these things. So, you know, we're talking about pride, humility, same thing. Uh, deadly force or not, you know, vandalism versus burglary or, or home invasion, we call it today. Uh, you know, the lines are there. And I'm thinking as I'm listening to all this discussion today, I said, yeah, that guy probably heard the same thing that I did. You know, I sat in class for seven weeks at police academy. I don't know, 400 something hours of classroom instruction in seven weeks. I mean, your head's just spinning when you leave. And they said, now, this is by the book. You know, you can't violate anybody's rights. You got to do this, 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 and you're thinking, yeah, yeah, you got all that. And the last thing before we leave, they line you up and I say, now, we taught you what the book says. And that's great. So, but we want to leave you with this final piece of advice. That when you're out in the field and when push comes to shove, it's always to be, it's always better to be judged by 12 than carried by 6. Okay? And so where when I'm listening to this story today, I'm thinking, yes, that's exactly what this 64-year-old man is thinking. So I really don't care. I'm getting out of here alive today, and they can sort it all out later. It comes down to that many times. And that's ultimately what we do in our lives about pride and humility. God's going to judge us. Okay? So we, we do what we think we understand he wants us to do, and, and what is the best thing we thank him for doing it. But... I understand the casual use of the word pride and the general thing of, you know, I'm satisfied, I'm happy with what I did, exactly. I, I've done my best, I'm okay with that. In that sense, pride is okay. Yes. Amen. Quote, unquote. But it's really easy to step across the line and take the honor and glory that belongs to God himself. And again, another Bible example would be uh, King Herod in the New Testament. You remember that story, right? They were flattering him. They wanted something from him. So he came in to give a speech. And of course, he liked attention. And he, he gave us great speech. And they began to say, Oh, it's the voice of a God and, and not a man. And the Bible says, Because he took the honor and glory that belonged to God, he just, he, uh, he let him die right there. And he let the worms consume him right in their sight. He said, okay, There's your God. Okay. And it says very plainly, because he took the glory, it was pride, he took the glory that belonged to God. And, and that's the that's the, the thing we have to be very careful of. Depends on what kind of pride. Yeah. Yes. I'm proud of you. Is that that's good, isn't it? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I hope you're proud of what the Lord's doing through me. See, that would be the true definition. Okay. That's true. In him we live and move and have our being. But but it's okay to be satisfied and happy, as it says in Ecclesiastes, with the work that we've done and rest and go, ah, like today I finished a movie maker project that I've been working on for a week and God just gave me the energy to do it in an hour. Okay, and um, I'm happy with that. 
But if I started thinking, man, I'm really, really good at this. I bet you that I could beat everybody else. Drawing the line. I have to ask for help all the time. Yeah, me too. Me too. Me too. Me too. I was ready to call Brother Chris this morning. Yeah. I tried to fix my van out there. But I'm driving it tonight, thank the Lord. Thanks, God. If you ask enough questions in the right places, you get the answers. Now i got to fix Rose's car. Very proud that you have to work so hard. <laughs> so, <laughs> people are proud of their humility. You know? Yeah. <laughs> that reminds me of the story of the guy, they voted the most humble person in the church, and uh, they gave him an award, and so since he went up to receive the award, they took it away from him. <laughs> Yeah, that's an illustration of that. Yeah. <laughs> but pride is one of the three things the devil tempts us with. So we do have to be cautious. We have to know that that is his thing. The lust of the flesh, the lust eyes, and the pride, pride of life. Of life. Mm-hmm. It was a problem for Adam and Eve. It was a problem for Solomon and all his wisdom. You know, he uh, tried it on Jesus, but it didn't work too good with him. They usually tempt us in that order too. I've noticed. I've I've, I've noticed almost all. Now maybe it's just me, but I've I've noticed that he usually almost always tempts us. To, first he'll try the lust of the flesh, and if and if we get through that, he'll try the lust of the eyes, and if we get through that, he'll start putting some pride in us, and we'll start thinking, hmm, okay, you know, I'm doing pretty good, you know. Uh, it's possible. I don't know that you know that. Is that it always? So everybody. Right. Yeah. Everybody. But, yeah. But I do know he knows what works best for us. I keep kidding with the football team. You, you know, we, we run a play and we make good yardage, and then we never see it again the rest of the game. Finally, at the end of the season, we finally got, you know, if you run a play and it does good, run it again. <laughs> run it again until they stop it, you know? Right. That's right. That's what the devil does. See, when he finds what works on you and me, why would he look for something else? He's just going to keep coming back to that same thing that works until, guess what, it doesn't work anymore. Right. But for that part. Uh, it's interesting. I was translating today in 1 Timothy 6. And I've said it before, and I actually have a Bible verse for this statement now. Because I say most of the arguing is just arguing about semantics. Mm-hmm. And so semantics are the meanings we attach to words. So, you know, we, we could be arguing about whether pride is good or bad, depending on what meaning we're, you're attaching to the word pride. And what you attach to the word pride may not be the same thing that I attach to it. And so why do we spend our time arguing about the word instead of the concept? And he said that's what these, these people do that um, Paul was talking about. He said they have uh, perverted their minds. They've been defrauded of the truth. And so all they want to do is launch into a long, and it's the, the, the Greek word is literally die traps. And when Paul went to Mars Hill, that's actually what they were doing. They were diatribia. That's what they said. And uh, the trivial pursuit was popular here a few years ago. So here are Tell something new. That's all they want to know. Talk about words that, that argue, argue about things that have no meaning, no consequence. Do no, no good as far as drawing people in and finding them are concerned. So that's a valid point. We'll be studying that soon on, well, sometime on Sunday. That's chapter 6. We're just now finishing chapter 1. Right. Mm-hmm. It was interesting. Arguing about words. The same concept is in chapter one, though, vain, uh, vain, as what you just described. The vain, the vain jangling. The vain jangling, this is idle and disgusting. Yeah, literally arguing about words. Right. Well, that's not what I mean by, well, okay, then say what you mean. That's okay. <laughs> 
Amen. That's it. But, but, but if we take the glory that belongs to God, that's no good for us. What's that? Oh, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Sure. I pray at my house so that we be all that hands and um in the bedroom and we pray we do it. That's yeah. wonderful. That's good. Thank you. Guys, mine. Yes. Any other questions? Okay. And we'll be ready to pray and be dismissed. That's your cue, Haley. Mouse pointer. Okay.